Great. So hopefully you all can see my screen. Um, please shout out if you can't. Um, so once again, yes, welcome to uh, this Fish Bash. Um, this particular one is hosted by Karma. Um, and I want to thank all the Fish Bash organizers in general um, for letting us set this up. And I want to thank you guys in advance for coming. Um, so in case you haven't been to a Bish Bash meetup before, um, what is it? Um, this is a space for academics and researchers from around the Bay Area and right now, since we're virtual, um, from beyond the Bay Area to gather um, and to get to know each other and get to learn more about topics in um, audio signal processing work and research. Um, so we have an awesome uh, array of different universities and different companies, as you can see here. Um, and it's really great that we can all gather to um, grow and help each other continue to build awesome tools. So yeah, the point is, um, let's learn about the latest advances in the field. Um, Fish Bash is also a space where um, if you want to present your latest and greatest research, um, definitely reach out to the organizers and you can be a presenter. Um, so this, yeah, this platform is really open to anyone. And also it's a great space to just connect, network both professionally and casually and make lots of new friends. It's really exciting to see a lot of familiar faces um, in the chat room right now. So we encourage you to keep attending, um, keep showing up and reach out if you're interested in presenting or hosting. So today's agenda is um, we'll go through three talks, um, three technical talks um, by Orchi, John, and Morteza. Each will be 15 minutes with a five minute Q&A afterwards. Then at around 7.10, we'll have a little 10 minute open floor discussion period. And this is where um, anybody can just speak up um, and mention something, um, mention you're hiring, you're interested in um, some opportunity or let us know about a really cool tool you just found out about, etc. cetera. Um, that's what the open floor is for. And then afterwards, um, until around eight o'clock or until people, um, as long as people want to stay on, we'll have breakout sessions. And this time we're trying something, um, something new. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll keep the main Zoom room that you're in right now open. And this will be for a casual network conversation. Have speaker um, host their own for deep dives into their talks. If you have additional questions that we couldn't get to during Q and A, um, etc. So, um, and then lastly, we'll have um, an additional Zoom room link for professional networking. Um, so this would be the space if you want to um, check out if anybody is is hiring, is you know talk about more I guess specific career um, plans or questions, etc. Um, so. Those links will be um, will be to you in the, using the email that you signed um, you signed up for this this meetup with, um, and then they'll also be posting um, the four additional Zoom links. And um, feel free to move back and forth between the rooms um, and um, check out see who's around where and feel free to have conversation and kind of make that that time your own. Um, with that, oh, a few more things actually about about Bish Bash. So um, yeah, so it's spreading around the world. So we have, so the San Francisco Bish Bash has been going on for a while. Um, there have been two hosted in Tokyo, Bish Bash in Paris, um, and we can continue to grow them to other cities around the world. Um, so with that, again, uh, spread the word, invite your friends, invite your colleagues that are interested. Um, while it's virtual, this is also open up to anyone around the world. And um, please reach out to the organizers um, if you're interested in hosting uh, the next Bish Bash Meetup. Uh, you can find more information on um, the Meetup page itself and um, be sure to join the LinkedIn group and uh, follow Bish Bash on Twitter. So with the logistics out of the way, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we can get into the talks. So I am super excited to host our first speaker. Um, So our first speaker is Orchi Sama Das. Um, she is my friend and colleague 
at Stanford. Um, and actually, before I do that, I also want to thank my organizers, my fellow um, Karma organizers, Elena, who uh, you might have already seen, and Blair, um, for their help in setting this up. And so, um, yeah, we wanted to open up also with another member of the Karma community, or Orchi Samadas. She is a um, about to be a fifth year PhD student, and um, I really look up to her as someone um, inspiring to me for um, the way she thinks about DSP problems and also just her love for music. Um, and so we're excited, really excited to have her start us off. Um, so her research area is in audio signal processing. Um, she focuses particularly on modal estimation, artificial reverberation, and source separation. Um, she's also currently a in research intern at Facebook Reality Labs. She attained her undergraduate degree in instrumentation and electronics engineering from Jadavpur University in Calcutta. And in her free time, Orji likes playing, recording, and producing music. This particular talk will focus on a classic problem in audio engineering, um, microphone bleed cancellation. Um, bleed or crosstalk between microphones is often a nuisance while recording ensembles in small studios with strong early reflections and measures such as close miking and sound isolation booths um, have to be set up to mitigate it. So she'll go over existing signal processing approaches, um, their shortcomings, and talk a little bit about how her thesis um, fits into this area of research. So with that, I will hand the floor over to Orchi. And Orchi, feel free to share your screen and get started. Uh, hello, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Yep. OK, awesome. Uh, let's share my screen. Oops, I'm sharing the wrong screen. <laughs> OK. Um, can you see my screen now? Yep. OK, awesome. Um, so uh, thank you, Camille, for the introduction. Um, as Camille said, I am about to start maybe my ultimate or penultimate year of PhD. We'll see how it goes. Um, and I sort of chose to focus on this topic because I think it, it combined a lot of my areas of interest. So I'm I was sort of I'm sort of interested in statistical signal processing, but I'm also uh, really into room acoustics and things like that. And I and I think like this particular problem um, combined all of that. So um, uh, I would also uh, you know fair warning this is a work in progress. I am definitely uh, haven't solved this problem. So the results I'm going to present to you might be a bit underwhelming, but uh, I, I really you know appreciate your feedback because I'm also in the middle of working things out and looking for new ideas to approach this problem. And haven't implemented everything I've tried yet, so I'm pretty much like halfway done. Uh, but I want to share uh, my insights on this particular topic. Um, so uh, what is microphone bleed? It's just crosstalk between multiple microphones. Uh, like you can see in this picture, when you're recording on some that is dedicated to each instrument. But in a closed space like this, um, if you've got loud instruments, then obviously there is going to be a lot of crosstalk between those microphones. And this is undesirable because when you're mixing a song, uh, ideally, this is not always true, but ideally you want to separate each instrument because you want to apply different effects to each instrument. So audio engineers would typically use some hacks uh, to do this. They would um, uh, use close miking, which is, you know, uh, putting the microphone really close to the instrument that you want to record so that um, it primarily captures that instrument and not the other ones. Then you've got directional microphones. For example, you can use a cardioid microphone, uh, which will only capture sound from a particular direction and negate sound coming from another direction. Um, and you can use acoustic isolation booths, which is pretty common, especially when you're recording drums, since they are the loudest instrument. But also not all studios have this and uh, the kind of expenses. Uh, so from a signal processing point of view, why is this problem tricky? Um, something that really complicates it is actually room acoustics and the effect of room reverberation. Um, uh, in this picture, for example, you can see that one guitar is being recorded by two microphones and each microphone just gets a scaled and delayed signal and this produces comb filtering like artifacts. Um, and you can hear that in the audio and we ideally want to get rid of it. Um, now, closed miking sort of solves this problem of room reverberation because it uh, negates the effect of late reverberation. Uh, but then the first few reflections 
um, are present and they're particularly strong if you've got uh, more reflective surfaces where you're recording. A lot of studios have soundproof walls, but if you're recording it, you know, in somebody's uh, house or room, then that's not really true. So the more reflective surfaces you have in a room, the more microphone bleed or crosstalk there will be. Also, we can have any number of sources and any number of microphones. The system can be overdetermined or underdetermined. That makes it complicated. And obviously doing it in a blind way. That is, we assume that we do not have any prior information about the room geometry and also uh, the location of the mics and the sources. Uh, so the mathematical formulation of this problem is uh, not very hard to understand. The X over here is the microphone signal for the mth microphone. And you can see that it picks up the direct source, which is S, convolved with this direct acoustic transfer function. And this whole part over here is just uh, the interference from uh, the other sources. And in, we can convert it to the time frequency domain and we can see that, okay, uh, this just becomes a linear system. So you've got the microphone signals X in a vector and you've got this matrix H, which is the acoustic transfer function matrix, which multiplies the source signals. And you also assume that you have some kind of a noise. Uh, now this acoustic transfer function matrix, it uh, not only encodes the room impulse response, but also the directivity pattern of the sources and the radiation pattern of the sources. Um, so the standard approach to doing this is to use a multi-channel Wiener filter. And um, the idea behind the Wiener filter is that you have um, your S hat that you're trying to estimate and you are uh, writing it as an inverse filtering problem and you're trying to estimate the optimum inverse filtering coefficients. So the coefficients of W. And you do this by minimizing the mean squared error. And ultimately, it gives you this expression uh, where you can see that um, this optimal filter weight, it depends on the PSD from the, the power spectral density. I should have written that out from the mth source to the mth mic. So the microphone that's closest, so the source that is closest to the mic, the power spectral density of that, divided by the total power spectral density. And this term in particular is the cross power spectral density between um, the mth microphone and the ith source. So the trick then is to estimate all of these power spectral densities. And also notice that these are short term, short time PSDs. Typically when you're uh, estimating a power spectral densities, you will average over multiple number of frames. Uh, but in this case, you can either estimate it one frame at a time or, but that ideally will not give you very good results. So you might average it over, you know, like say five frames or six frames, anything like that. Um, and how do you estimate the short time PSDs? Well, you can use um, a weighted sum like this, where you say, okay, the PSD for the current frame is a sum of the PSD for the previous frame, current microphone signal. And we can use, write this term only because we've assumed closed microphones. So for closed microphones, we know that S and X are actually pretty equal. Uh, they're similar if they are, um, Okay, let me phrase it in another way. That is, um, for the mth source and the mth, mth microphone, since they're placed very close to each other, we can sort of approximate them to be equal. Uh, but the problem is then becomes estimating these cross PSDs. Um, and for this, um, the assumption is that, okay, we're only going to take the direct path under consideration. So you have some kind of a scalar gain followed by a delay. Um, and then you can use this approximation to relate um, the cross spectral densities to the direct spectral density, which we get from here. But you can see that um, this is a very crude approximation because it completely ignores the effect of the early reflections or late reverb for that matter, and only takes the direct path into consideration. So room for improvement here is obviously um, trying to model it differently because if you're modeling the transfer function simply as an attenuated gain factor, then that's not very accurate. Um, and it's tricky because we are trying to now not only estimate the sources, but also the transfer functions in a blind way from just these microphone signals that we have. So this is quite a difficult problem to solve. 
Uh, this slide has a bit of math, but uh, I'm not going to go into the detail. Um, I'll talk about one equation in particular. So this is again reiterating the uh, problem that we have here. Given x, we want to estimate h and s. Uh, but we're also assuming that we have some sort of an idea about what h is. So that's what h tilde is. And I'll discuss in the next slide how we can estimate h tilde. Um, then we, you know, form some probability distributions and say that, okay, we're going to maximize the joint likelihood and it becomes like a maximum likelihood estimation. And then writing down the cost function essentially gives us this, uh, which is, uh, which looks very familiar. It's just a regularized least squares term. So we can see that, okay, we are just minimizing um, the square of the error, uh, but we're also adding some kind of a regularization term and we're ensuring that the h that we estimate is kind of close to h tilde, which was our initial guess for what h is. And this is um, the regularization parameter, which is actually just depends on um, the variance of these two noises. So how do we go about estimating h tilde, which is you know, an initial estimate of what the transfer function could be? Um, so this is easy to do when you're recording things in a studio because as um, you're setting each instrument up, you can always ask one musician to play at a time so that only one source is active and all the other sources are in inactive. And then you can take the spectral ratio and this will give you an idea about what the acoustic transfer function could be. Similarly, if you don't have that kind of pre-computation, you can um, detect solo intervals in your music when only one source is active and then take the spectral ratio. So I've got some plots here which show you that uh, this doesn't really work very well. So on top, you can see the actual transfer functions. And uh, the second plot is what the estimated transfer functions are if we use this kind of an estimation scheme and they're not, they do not match very well. Uh, but since we're solving an optimization problem, um, that as we optimize the acoustic transfer functions, this uh, discrepancy is taken care of. So um, there are a couple of advantages to this method. Not only are we estimating the sources, we're also estimating the transfer functions. And this is also a, a pretty important problem, you know, where if you have uh, a multiple input, multiple output uh, bl blind channel identification system, those are very hard to solve for. Uh, so this method at least proposes a way to solve that. Um, this is a derivation that was quite complicated to do, but I've been able to prove that the cost function is convex, which means that it is convex uh, in both S and H and any kind of a gradient based method um, I use will always converge to the global solution. And the way I've modeled it, it ensures that the, the transfer function that I estimate is uh, time invariant. And this is typically a, a valid assumption for rooms. Um, so if we assume that our sources and microphones are not really moving, then this time variant assumption is a good one. But also the obvious disadvantages are that I'm solving a huge, huge optimization problem uh, for each frequency bin. I'm also not taking into account any kind of uh, prior statistics about the sources or the transfer functions, um, which is something, so this estimation scheme is not Bayesian. And obviously something that's Bayesian like MMSE, which the Wiener filter is, will perform better. Um, so to test how, if my method even made sense, I sort of set up like a virtual studio where I had some um, string quartet recordings that were anechoic. And I placed them in a semicircle in sort of a medium sized rooms uh, with half a second of T60. And I placed some virtual microphones in front of these instruments and at a distance of like 20 centimeters to sort of still have that closed microphone assumption. And then I found the room impulse responses with the image source method uh, and then convolved them and added things up to simulate microphone bleed. Um, and I can play some results for you um, here. I, I, I can, I'll warn you that the method I have proposed does not work as well as the multi-channel Wiener filter that already exists, uh, but it does give sensible results. So we can, we can listen to what it sounds like. So the first uh, sound I'm gonna be playing is just the cello bleeding into the viola microphone. I, 
I hope you could hear that. Great. Um, the second is the viola bleeding into the cello microphone. <laughs> Um, the next sound I'm going to play is using the multi-channel Wiener filter, which is the state of the art to do this. So this is the cleaned viola signal. The cleaned cello signal. Uh, the next is the method I, that I have proposed. Uh, so you can hear that it uh, does not do as well as the multi-channel winner filter, um, which definitely cancels out bleed much better, but then uh, it also introduces some artifacts. I don't know if you could hear with Zoom's audio. Um, so it, it does a very good job of cleaning up the signals, but sometimes also introduces a little bit of distortion artifact. So I've, I've got, you know, lots on my plate to do. Uh, now that I have these preliminary results, I know that the MLE estimator uh, can be improved. So I'm planning to sort of use a map estimator and MMSE estimator, which um, should give me better results. Um, another question I have is, you know, how do I tune this hyperparameter? Uh, because this is what is going to give me a trade-off between a bleed cancellation and signal distortion. Um, and then I have to generate a lot more data, you know, where I vary the room T60s, uh, the room size, the distance between the source and the microphones and so on, and generate a bunch of data and then get some objective measures using this toolbox, uh, which is commonly used for source separation and also have a perceptual listening test. Uh, and then something I want to think about, but I'm not focusing on currently is what happens, you know, if the system is overdetermined, like what happens if we have more microphones than sources? Ideally, that should give me better results. And finally, the big test case is to actually going to be, you know, to test this on um, some data I record in the recording studio. I do not know when that's going to be possible, but I plan to record some drums and try to de-bleed them because cymbal bleed is a very common problem. Um, and it's, it's, I think it's going to be quite tricky to solve. So yeah, lots, lots to do. And I, and I welcome your input about, you know, am I thinking in the right, right direction? Could I think about this differently? Um, and these are the references. If, if you're interested in this problem, the first three references um, is by the person who proposed the Wiener filtering approach. And his thesis is a, a really good starting point. Uh, because he does a lot of experimental evaluations as well, and I learned a lot from his thesis. So I hope I can contribute something novel to this problem. Thank you. Thank you so much, Archie. And now I'll invite everyone to unmute yourself and give Archie a nice Zoom round of applause. Elena, I think you might have cut out. I think you were saying that. Um, oh yes, I'd like to invite everyone you can give to give applause. Yourself. And <laughs> yeah, and meet yourself, and let's give Archie some applause. <laughs> or snaps. Um, also, we have a few minutes for any Q and A's you want to ask um, now that other people might find useful. Um, I believe there's already one question from Richard in the chat, um, which we maybe could start out with. Uh, right. Uh, yes. So I, I did try to use the CVX toolbox, which is the convex optimization toolbox. But then I realized that CVX has very strict rules on what is considered a disciplined convex optimization problem. And mine was not. Therefore, I had to proceed with the uh, MATLAB solvers, which is, you know, I mean, I would have loved to use CVX. But currently, I'm actually using MATLAB F solve to do this. And yeah, it's not super fast, but it works. Um, oh, I think so they maybe, can't unmute. Yeah. So I guess if if anyone has a question, um, and uh, I think we can we can unmute you. So if you want to like raise your hand in the participant list, um, then we can see and we can unmute you. Right. 
Right. So I, I used MATLAB's F solve. I try, also tried using uh, F min con, which is, you know, typically used for uh, solving constraint optimization problems. But I got much better results with F solve. So the way I do this right now is uh, I actually explicitly set the gradient to zero and then solve uh, for the roots of this polynomial. And that what that's what works best. F min con didn't work that well. Uh, hi, Archie. Um, uh, thanks hi. for the uh, awesome talk. Um, I'm, I'm kind of, this is a naive question, but I'm just kind of curious about your thoughts about the formulation of the problem at a high level and its difference from the source separation problem. They, they seem similar to me, but maybe, you know, yeah, I'd just like to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, it's actually, it's, it's very, very similar. And um, so I think it would be also interesting to compare my method to some existing BSS methods, because this is also what they try to do. Um, but I, I haven't seen yet people who, you know, trying to uh, do two things like people always try to estimate the sources, but this transfer function estimation, I haven't really seen this. So I think that is something that I'm focusing on. Um, because I think it's also so much work on blind channel identification. Um, and that's a solved problem if you have like a single input and multiple outputs. But the moment you have multiple inputs and multiple outputs, it becomes really tricky. So I think that that's where I want to make a contribution with this thesis. Awesome, thanks. I just got unmuted. Thank you. Uh, it's also really cool to see uh, more like more unique closed form solutions in this space rather than, than just generic, you know, like deep learning estimators. Yeah, great work. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't really know deep learning. That's why I didn't use it. <laughs> awesome. Um, well, I guess um, if there are no more questions right now, um, just a reminder, you can ask Orchi more questions if you think of them in the breakout session afterwards. Um, and, oh, I guess Chris has has one more question. And actually. And Bob. Yeah. So go ahead, Chris. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. I wasn't sure if I was supposed to type or raise my hand. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering, uh, you mentioned that like closed miking is a typical like kind of hacky solution that audio engineers will use to limit this problem. But then you also said that your method kind of like assumes that mics are closed. Um, when computing like filter parameters. So I was curious, like if you could elaborate on that. Right, so I, uh, the closed microphone assumption is mostly for the calculation of the initial transfer function, because mm -hmm. that's, we can see that the direct of uh, source to microphone ratio is like an all pass filter, which is, on, which is not even true in real life, but it's an assumption that I've making. So I think that's where uh, the main problem is going to arise as I start increasing the distance from, um, the microphone to the source, but that's why I have so, this sort of hyperparameter that can take care of it, um, because I can always make the hyperparameter value quite small to say that okay, I don't want uh, the optimum transfer function estimate to be close to this initial transfer transfer function estimate that I give you, especially if the microphone to source distance is very large. Yeah, and also just as like a real quick question, so one of the slides you showed like the actual transfer function as a reference. I was just wondering where that was coming from. Uh, yes, sure. Uh, so this is uh, from the simulated data that I uh, was oh, talking okay. about. Got it. That's with the image source method. Thanks. So, Orchi, it's it was great. I'm, and I'm glad, as somebody else just said, it wasn't strictly machine learning. I'm glad it was closed form and that you, that you got um, some answer. Now, my question is, what you got sounded very similar to what you would get with a uh, cardioid or a hypercardioid polar pattern. It sounded great. Uh, and what I mean by great is there were no artifacts, as you pointed out. Um, what were the artifacts that we were getting? It almost sounded like, um, like an envelope closing down, like noise gating or something with the, uh, the Wiener filter. Do you, can you um, give us some insight into what was going on there? Yeah, right. Uh, like you said, it's sometimes it did sound like a noise gate. So it does a very 
like harsh delete. Uh, and so I got some um, code from the author of, of the paper. Uh, and I don't, I mean, I know what's going on inside, but I don't know if, if he has something where I can control to sort of give me a trade off between audible distortion versus deep bleeding. Um, but I think it's the way that um, the power spectral densities are estimated. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of, uh, if you read that paper, like there's a lot of heuristic parameters there that he's tuning just by, you know, it, there's no like hard and fast rule for doing that. You kind of try a bunch of parameters till you get the result that you want. Um, so also that, that's another problem with this Wiener filter method that you have to give it a lot of things as input. Uh, whereas my method just requires this one hyperparameter that I'm saying, okay, just give me this one value that controls the trade-off. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Because it sounds like he's that the Wiener filter is making some kind of a binary decision, which would give you that noise gating effect. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Let's give a final virtual round of applause to Orchi. Thank you so much. Uh, now I'm excited to introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is John Gillick. John Gillick is a researcher and music producer engineer currently working towards his PhD at UC Berkeley in the School of Information, uh, where he is advised by David Bauman. He's also affiliated with Berkeley CINMAT, uh, where he's working with Dr. Sella. Uh, his research interests lie at the intersection of machine learning, music technology, and human-computer interaction. His current work centers around exploring new ways of creating and understanding music and sound using machine learning. John previously interned at Google Magenta and is currently an intern with the Audio Research Group at Adobe. Uh, let's give John a virtual round of applause. Welcome. Thanks, Alina. Um, thanks everyone for coming and for uh, to the organizers for having me. Um, so let me share my screen real quick. Um, so I can get started. Okay, great. Can you all see my screen? Cool. Oh, wait, actually, I think I need to make sure I do audio. So I'm going to unshare and then share again. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so uh, hi again, I'm John Gillick from uh, UC Berkeley. And today I'm going to talk about one of my favorite research projects, um, which is called Making Beats with Interactive uh, Machine Learning. So just, uh, just I want to give a, a quick minute of, of sort of my motivation for, for this research area and sort of what I do. Um, so uh, this picture right here is my Tascam 788 from around 2002. So this is like the first piece of, of music uh, creation technology that got me really inspired um, to actually become like a, not just a you know, musician who was playing like the guitar or the keyboard, but um, to actually create stuff. So I, I guess at the time, sort of a common perception that I was hearing from other people, like my teachers, about how music works is that you, you sort of learn first um, and after you've mastered sort of enough, whatever enough is on your, on your technique, then you can create later. Um, but I, I think that that approach doesn't necessarily work for everyone. I, I was sort of the opposite. I liked to, I liked to mess around um, with sounds and sort of uh, record multiple things together and, and see how they, how they worked. And then after I failed, I would, realize I need to go back and, and maybe learn some more techniques. So I think sort of um, these kind of new technologies for controlling sound actually, I hope can inspire people to get involved in, in creativity um, when they might not otherwise do that. Um, yeah, so the sort of like the sort of benefits of this stuff that I see is that sometimes access to technology enables people to learn or create music in a way that suits them. Of course, that's not for everybody. There's plenty of people who don't need any of this stuff. And, and this sort of, especially uh, machine learning based technology, of course, has, has 
risks as well as benefits. And so we have to be really mindful about the, um, the way that we approach it. Cool, so um, just uh, at the very high level, um, here are a few, uh, I'm not gonna get into the details of each one of these sort of different examples of types of music research um, paths, but I'm, I'm sort of uh, trying to combine the power of generative models and deep learning with, with some controls uh, inspired by work on gesture mapping and all of this in an environment, uh, situated in an environment where uh, we're trying to help and inspire composers and, and producers. So um, my work sort of uh, in the context of this, of this landscape is, is really focused on this question, at least for this talk. So it's, can we enable flexible and useful uh, controls for interacting with uh, generative models of music? And so I'm gonna be talking about generative models in the sense of uh, um, deep learning models. So with apologies, I am going straight for the machine learning without getting uh, into too much uh, signal processing in this talk. Um, so I'm specifically going to focus on the case of, of drums for, for this talk. So um, this image right here is a, a, something that you would see commonly inside music production software. It's uh, visualizing a sequence of MIDI notes for a, a, a drum loop. Um, MIDI those instruments. And so a lot of the uh, music that we listen to right now, so most famously like electronic music and hip hop, but now all sorts of music, uh, pop music um, is very much created using interfaces like this one. And so we, we can click and drag notes around uh, and edit them and compose this way. So one challenge with, uh, with working this way is that it is slow and difficult to edit the precise timing and uh, dynamics of, of, of individual notes and to get something that, that might sound the way um, a person would perform if we're actually writing, we may be often writing for instruments that we don't ourselves play. Um, so like I'm, uh, I, play the, I play the guitar, but I'm not actually, uh, I don't have a drum set. I'm, a, I'm kind of a so-so drummer, um, but I still have a, a strong sense of what kind of drums I want to hear in my, in my tracks. Um, so uh, yeah, this, so this isn't to say that um, music, uh, you know, drum beats created in this in this form are necessarily better or worse. Um, there are just some limitations to to what we can do with with like the technology that's available right now. Okay, so just a, a lightning quick overview of uh, of what a, a generative model is in the in the context I'm talking about for those who might not be familiar. So this picture is sort of like the classic. Uh, diagram of a, of a VAE, which is a variational autoencoder. And the idea is it has two pieces, an encoder and a decoder. Um, each of those pieces are, are neural networks. Um, and the encoder takes a, a data point. In this case, it would take like a, a drum loop, or it could be a, a melody or, or any other sort of a musical fragment. And it will encode it into this, uh, what we call latent vector Z, um, which is a low dimensional representation of the input. And then we have the other neural network, the decoder, is trained to reconstruct the original input, right? And if we, if we do this right, then the end result of this process is that we have the ability to sample from this uh, distribution of these latent vectors Z. And uh, so we can sort of randomly generate new uh, musical fragments that, that sound, that look and sound like the ones in our training data. Um, another thing that that people have experimented with is, is doing what's called vector arithmetic in this sort of latent space. So we can take the average some sort of, in some sort of semantic sense between two different uh, musical ideas. And then we can decode that average vector and get something that's sort of halfway between the two things. Okay, so um, yeah, in recent years, some people have, uh, have shown that VAE, uh, the sort of, this is the, uh, diagram that I was just showing that variational autoencoders can, can do a really impressive job at generating um, actually uh, data in MIDI formats. So we can generate melodies or, or drum loops um, with this sort of powerful, uh, with this powerful model. And, and it, in this case, what's our, so what's our mechanism for, for control um, when we have a model like this? So 
we have two main things that we can do once we have uh, this model trained properly. One, we can take a sample. So we can randomly generate a new uh, drum loop that's going to sound similar to the ones in our trained data. Or we can do, uh, do what I just mentioned, vector arithmetics. We can take the average of two different things and move around that way. Um, so here, here's the question I'm going to try to, to answer in the rest of this talk, which is, um, how do we tell the VAE more specifically what we want it to generate? Um, can we come up with more explicit controls that, uh, that allow us to do something beyond random sampling or, or averaging? Um, so to start thinking about how we can control a model that generates uh, drum loops, let's, let's start by digging a little deeper into what a drum loop actually is. So one way to do that is to, uh, to try to break it down into components. So here's maybe the simplest way we could break down what a drum loop or a musical performance in general is. Um, and that's to break it down into uh, what we can call the score and what we can call the groove. So the score uh, visualized on the left specifies what notes, or in this case, what drums should be played, but it doesn't say how they should be played. And so if we, if we render the score without any groove, um, it's going to sound like this. And I'm about to play an uh, audio example, so if my audio doesn't play, please let me know. Cool. And on the right, we have a, a visualization of, of the groove, which is sort of a, a elusive concept in music. But here, I'm using it to refer to the particular dynamic of a performance. If we, uh, if we describe it as sort of like the pattern of, of onsets like this, um, we can listen to it and it, will, and it would sound like this. Cool, so if we take those two things together, um, we get sort of a description of, of the entire performance. And so when a drummer plays, they produce both of these at the same time without really thinking about it. Um, and if you give them one of them, they're, they're, they're pretty good at filling in the other one. So, uh, okay, in this next portion of the talk, I'm gonna cover some results that were published last year. Um, this part of the work was done in collaboration with uh, Adam Roberts and Jesse Engel and uh, Doug Eck from uh, Google Magenta, and also my advisor, David Bamman at UC Berkeley. Um, and this work really centers around some initial investigations into this question of controlling a generative model. And I don't have time to go into a lot of details about the data set. I should also uh, plug that we did release a data set of uh, recordings of professional drummers playing um, these MIDI uh, drum kits that are uh, available uh, for free, which you can download. Cool. So um, what we explored here is, is taking steps to, to describe one mechanism of control for a generative model. And that's um, to condition the generative model on a simplified MIDI representation, uh, like something that could be created by a user. Um, so the image all the way on the left shows like a fully realized drum loop. This is a performance that's played by a drummer. And as we look at the rest of the images uh, moving from left to right, they're sort of increasingly simplified versions of the loop. And uh, we can create these simplified versions by manipulating a MIDI sequence. And we can, for example, by quantizing it or collapsing all the notes onto one channel or removing some instruments. Um, and in, in this work, what we did is we trained, uh, we trained a model that would take a sort of simplified version of this music performance fragment or drum loop. And we would train it from, to map from the simplified version to the original data, which is like the full performance. So, if our original drum loop is a data point called x, what we did is define some function f of x, which simplifies x into a form that um, would be more easily creatable by a user of maybe within a software even. Um, and so this is just like a VAE, except instead of training the model to reconstruct x from itself, we train it to reconstruct x from f of x. Um, so we can give these models names. Indeed, a model that just adds the sort of score to the performance is called humanization. Other people have, have worked on this before. Um, or we can specify some other uh, function. Maybe we call this one F2, which uh, in this case, we're asking the model to um, given a sort of groove representation to add, decide what drum hits to play. Um, Okay, so I wanna show some quick audio examples of what this actually sounds like. So first I wanna play the, the sort of quantized beat. So this is something that you could click in 
as a user and it's visualized on the left. And this is what this beat sounds like. Cool. And um, now I'm going to play the one on the right, which is the output of the model. And so this is, uh, has added performance uh, details to the, to the beat that I input. So hopefully you can hear, hear the difference there. I know it can be a little bit subtle, but to my ears, I think that sounds, sounds a lot more natural, a lot more compelling. Um, so in this case, we're asking the model to do this for us. We're, we're automating the, the performance. We don't actually have control over what, how it performs it, but we at least say that we can input some kind of score and get some kind of performance. Um, or we could go, we could take this other example where we input a, a groove and we're asking it to, to play along with that groove. So, so on the left, we have like sort of that visualization of the groove. Um, which is actually created by me just tapping on the table in front of my microphone. So the audio file sounds like this. And so if I capture like the, the onsets uh, and velocities of that uh, little, little uh, performance on my table and then I put it into the model, then I get it to do this. Cool. And um, one more example of this one. So uh, we could also, uh, as long as it has musical um, sort of uh, timing and is along on a consistent tempo. So here's me playing a bass line. And then uh, this is a little video showing the interface that the, the Google Magenta team uh, created. Um, and so we'll see the, the model playing drums along with my bass line. Just clicking through the interface. Um. Cool. So, um, so yeah, so basically we did some sort of evaluations of, of what this, gener this generated um, music through this, through this conditioning mechanism sounds like. And, and basically it, the deep learning stuff works better than some earlier things that people had tried. Um, I mean, not surprisingly. And also this, this sort of a second chart from the, from the left shows that um, listeners had a hard time telling the difference between the, the sort of generated versions and the real thing. So they, with this data, um, they, do, they do sound pretty realistic. Cool. So um, just to go back to the, the sort of big question. So where we started is, is we have previous work that shows that we can do things like random sampling and interpolation. So we're going from X uh, back to X in an autoencoder. And now I, I just showed these examples of user, uh, of conditioning on a user input. So we're going from some function of X, F of X um, to X through this uh, variational information bottleneck model. Um, now for the, the last, the last um, part of my talk here, I'm just gonna to give like a little preview of some, some work in progress that I've been exploring um, to see if we can go further into actually controlling these outputs. So I think it's sort of a, a natural next, next step is to condition on more than one thing at once. So we wanna specify maybe two things, okay, say, okay, model, I want you to play this pattern. And okay, model, when you're playing this pattern, I want you to play it like this. So both of those are actually pretty easy for a user to create. Um, and it's, it's, it's still much harder to actually play the drums. Um, so I, I'm not a drummer, but I can create those two pieces individually. And so now I'm asking the model to put these together. I'm not asking it to decide either one of those things completely on its own. So this is sort of one step further um, in terms of trying to control what it's giving me. And so where I've ended up at um, that's worked best from what I've tried is a model that looks something like this. So we have um, the score on the top and we have the sort of groove on the bottom and we have a separate encoder for each one of these. Um, and so we're gonna have a, a latent space. So this is kind of like two VAEs, um, 
like the encoder and uh, latent space for two separate VAEs, except then we're going to um, concatenate the, uh, the embeddings and jointly decode them into the original thing. So I sort of broke it up the model in the same way. Um, and what this means is now we can input both of these, both of these two things uh, at once. So let me play uh, a quick example. First, let me play the, so this is the, the quantized input. I'm going to play the, what the score, musical score sounds like. So this is without any performance. So I'm telling the model, I want you to play this score. Well, cool. so this is like something I clicked into the, to the interface. And then I'm also going to tell the model at the same time, okay, I want you to play it like this. And the way that I specify that is through my uh, tap on the table, which sounds like this. Cool. And so when I put both of these into this model, it's going to sound like this. Cool. Again, these things are sometimes a little subtle, but hopefully you can hear, um, hear what it did. And maybe one way to illustrate that it's actually following like the conditioning is to give it the same score, um, but a different uh, groove and see what it does. So again, uh, here's the same score over again. But now I'm gonna give it a, a, a recording of me tapping with a different sort of feel. This is kind of a triplet feel. what the model does. Cool. Um, I think I'm going to skip this because I'm running out of time. Um, but uh, basically, I, I can show pe people this link later on if, uh, um, if you're interested. Basically, I just sort of want to illustrate like the future directions for this type of work, which is um, when a, when a music producer is actually working with a drummer, they have a lot of different ways of communicating. This, this could be different modalities through demonstrating through visual gesture or through words or through um, audio. So these are the kind of things that a uh, you know, producer might say, oh, I'm wondering if it should be a little more complex. Oh, keep the rim shot in the verses, maybe making a vocal imitations of the sound or playing some air drums or something like that. And so all of these types of things are, are are taking into account when a producer is, is working and specifying um, what they want something to sound like. And so this is sort of like, um, I think indicates the, the direction that I want to go in, which is like, how do we find more useful these? So if we can define those sorts of um, inputs or, or specifications through functions, um, then, and, we, and we have a model that takes into account all those different functions, then we can get more and more control um, so this is sort of like the, the, the direction that I'm interested in going. And um, that's all that I have. Thank you. And thanks to all my uh, collaborators who've worked with me on different parts of this. Um, so I know I went a little over time, but I'm happy to take questions if we, if we uh, can do that now. Thank you, John. Let's give John a round of applause. Great. So the issue where you couldn't unmute yourself should be fixed right now. Thank you for your patience on that. Um, I'd love to hear a few questions for John. If you have a question, please unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. Where can I, uh, where can I download whatever it is that you're using to make, to, to make um, these things? <laughs> is, that, is this available yet? Like, do you have code online for this? Or? So uh, the the last the last version that I showed with the two different controls, um, I haven't published that yet. So the the code's not available, unfortunately. But the earlier the the earlier part of the talk, um, all that stuff is 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 published. The code is available. Um, Magenta has released, uh, yeah, Google Magenta has released all of that, um, including the data, and they even have uh, plugins for Ableton Live to do the. Um, the humanized model and the uh, what's called Drumify. That was the name that we came up with um, to sort of the play along model. So yeah, you can you can download those. Just just search for uh, Google Magenta um, and Magenta Studio, and you can download all that stuff.
All right, yeah, because this is really, really cool. As somebody who's just starting uh, starting up again, like getting into like recording music, this would save me a lot of time and it would be really fun to play with. So that was, yeah, it was really dope. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, David has a question. I guess I have a question. Hey, oh, um, go ahead. Should I talk or wait till the, I'll, I'll wait. Okay. Um, well, John, do you have a chance to read in the uh, chat? Oh, yeah, I see it now. Um, yeah. Okay, David's question. I can read the question out loud, actually. Suppose you had genre information for the MIDI. Could you get one of the latent variables to represent genre? Maybe needs to be one hot or an encoding of 50 genres and around five numbers, etc. What are the techniques for understanding what each latent variable represents? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so along with that data set of, of drum performances that I'm using, I do have some genre information. I haven't, ex I've experimented with it a little bit, like so we can incorporate just the way that we have um, these, these controls for like what the score is or what the, what the sort of groove should be. We can also incorporate another control, which is just like a one hot uh, vector, which says what the genre is. Um, it, you may need to, it, it's tricky in practice to get these things to work in a way that you might expect. Um, so it does, it does take a lot of, of, at least for me, it's taken a lot of trial and error to come up with the right fit between what model you're using and what conditioning information you're using. So like all of the factors with each other. So like if you specify what the genre is, that's going to say a lot about what the score is and what the performance is likely to sound like. Um, so it doesn't completely make sense to, um, to say I want to play one, one thing in the style of another thing in every case. We can always try it and see what happens, um, which is really fun. But um, yeah, basically what I found, at least for the, the case of, of conditioning on two things at once, is that it really matters to have a latent, a specific latent variable. Um, so I, I showed like I had two separate encoders. So I have an encoder for score and for groove, and, and, and that mattered a lot. Um, I, I, you could try having an encoder for genre and, and put genre into a, a latent space. I'm not sure how that would work, but um, yeah, it, it, dep it depends on a lot of things. I'm not sure I have a great answer, sorry. Thank you, John. Uh, let's take one more question, one last question from Hassan. Yeah, I, uh, it's really fun. I, I, like, I like what you're doing with this. And it just, I think, um, I, I'm just curious about like, you know, as a composition tool, do you, have you explored tuplets with like other tuplets? Like uh, you, you did like the, I like how you showed like the groove, um, you know, in triplets and then against like a, a straight nose thing. Have you, have you ever explored like uh, any other like odd kind of tuplets over some other, I just like, yeah, I'm just curious, like how far you can kind of take this like uh, creatively. Yeah, I, I haven't really, yeah, I haven't tried that with like a group of five or, or seven or something. Um, but that's a, yeah, it's a good question. I think I probably have some of that in the data. I think the data is full of, of you know, things played straight and things played with swing and, and triplets. So I think it makes sense to expect that to work. If, if we don't have a lot of examples of it in the data set, it, it would probably be harder to, to expect it to work with that. Well, I just, yeah, I think it, it could be like a really useful for um, like expanding uh, your ear. You know, you can like use this tool to like learn about quintuplets and create septuplets against quintuplets and get something kind of, you know, moving in your ear. And uh, that's, it's, that's really exciting. Yeah, that's a great idea. I hadn't, I hadn't thought of that. Um, I'll have to try that out. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, thank you. A final round of applause for John. Thank you for sharing your work.